still on, by the way? Yeah, I have. Oh, there you are. Okay, I just needed to swipe you on my phone. Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, am I showing up in two places? I shouldn't be. I've got you and then straight chilling, which is okay, not yeah. uh, an image. Well, the me, like, yeah, I'm, I'm coming through the audio of straight chilling and I do my video on my phone. So, so, so yeah, there are two squares for you. On mine, it's just the two though, and that's what's recording. So, because I, I guess I have, Deal. I have straight chilling hidden on mine. So, I don't know why nice. it's different, but it works for me. All right. I guess I'm gonna do this guy again, because I mean, how can I not? Just, I'm gonna hold up this fucking thing because every everybody needs to own this. Dark universe. What the? Wait, let me see that again. <laughs> Bio, oh, oh, it's a collection. Jack O yes. and Friends. Three Holy movies. shit! Yeah. So, is this the only like, like official release they had? Because on v DVD, because I think I read somewhere that they only had the one release. Yeah, I think you could. Well, I know you could get it on VHS, but I think this is the only DVD release, and there is no Blu-ray or anything. Gotcha. Well, anyway, let's save it for the cast. What the fuck are we doing? We're talking about yeah. the only things we have to talk about already. Let's All right. let's do the show. Let's do it. Let's do the show. Ready when you are. Uh, yeah, so I'll play the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're good. <laughs> okay. I'm Let's explaining do it. things you already know. Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. Welcome to another jacked up episode of Straight Chilling, the weekly horror movie review show where you chill and we kill, slice, dice, and chop up yet another horror movie. My name's Bob. I'll be your host for the evening. This is episode number 338, recorded Sunday, September 26, 2021. Tonight, we're going to be talking about the movie Jack O from 1995. This was chosen by Matt G. Thank you so much, Matt, for showing us some love over on the Patreon and picking a flick for us to review. Before we get into the review, let me introduce everyone else on the show tonight. First up and last up, we got our boy, Brand New. What's up? Pumpkins. Get right used to that bump because this is the week, baby. We're getting pumpkins. all, all of pumpkins. the pumpkins this week. Oh. There's no avoiding I it. it. I mean, I this, love it I when mean, you pumpkin. The other, the alternative is to <laughs> use people saying things like, like, oh man, I just J-O'd. It was great. Oh man, I just watched. I just got some Jacko. It was it was a good time. I'm really calm now. Like I don't have Jack those bumps. Oh. Right. What an unfortunate name for a movie, dude. I know Jack Jacko. Also confusing because that is not what the title card of this movie says, which I know is not totally uncommon in horror. But man, they did not really do a whole lot of favors for themselves, did they? No, no, they really didn't. Uh, as you probably have noticed, Soju is out for the week. He went back to Korea, and uh, I think they found out that he was talking such mad shit about the representation of banh mi sandwiches in Halloween 2018, and they threw his ass in Korean jail. He's probably going to stay there for life. Night. It is what he's $100. Worth, dollars. $100 a night. That's what he's worth. Uh, but uh, before we get into the main event, talking about Jacko, let's get into some housekeeping, of which there's a decent amount. Uh, this, this is your final reminder, because this is the last episode of the month of September, uh, to get your votes in for the October poll pick, which is currently posted on our Patreon website. If you support us at the $5 level or above, you get a chance to vote on a movie we're talking about this October. The theme for October is classic horror movies. Three movies to vote between are Carrie, Child's Play, and Psycho. Blurb, blurb. <laughs> yes. Coffin daddy. Yes. Tell me what the numbers are. What are numbers? 
Numbers are consistent. Carries in first place, Child's plays in second, Psycho's in last place. Damn. Uh, Norman yeah. is spinning around right now, just ain't itching to get out, but sorry. It's right now, I, baby. I, I think, right round. Dude, I don't know. I guess, like, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by the choice of carry. I mean, all of them are good choices, but to me, it seems like I would have picked Psycho probably, personally. Yeah, uh, they want that De Palma goodness all up in I their ear so. holes. I guess mean, so. You know, the last De Palma we did was uh, dressed to kill. I guess it's time for one that that doesn't require so many asterisks. <laughs> Still, probably quite a few. But actually, fewer. yeah, that's probably that's fewer. fair. <laughs> that is fair. <laughs> uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, Carrie. Assuming that win. Make sure you get your votes in before October 1st. We'll see what we're talking about. Uh, we do have a brand new Patreon supporter. We got to give mad shouts outs to Ryan G. Thanks for signing up on Patreon and showing us some love. Every dollar you guys contribute goes right back into the show. And as is tradition around these parts, we owe Ryan the straight shelling salute. Here we go, sir. Yeah, my ass. Thank you, Ryan. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Um, you help pay for my rental of Jack O. <laughs> and, you know, take that for whatever it sounds like to you. It was worth it. And we'll yeah. we'll get into I just watched Jack that. O. And, man, I am so calm. So I am just, whew. Jack O's face is the name of the movie. Uh, big thanks to everybody that hung out with us for Elvira's 40th anniversary. Very scary, very special special, which was on Shudder uh yesterday as of uh, the time of this recording uh it's pretty cool to see elvira back on the screen doing what she does best um and uh as is uh shutter tradition joe bob briggs is doing another thing on shutter on uh friday october 8th at 9 p.m eastern standard time he's doing his last drive-in double feature um and we're gonna be doing another live watch for that so mark your calendars friday october 8th friday october 8th 9 p.m eastern standard time Eat. Yes. Eat. Friday, Friday the Eat. Friday the Eat. Um, what else do we have? Yeah, we got so much. Fuck my ass. What Fuck else? my ass. Uh, we're doing a uh, Chilloween party. This is our yeah, first, we are. Ever, first ever Chilloween party. Uh, we're hosting it. We're hosting it on Zoom. And this is a Patreon only event. It's going to be taking place Friday, October 15th at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're gonna be playing some horror trivia. We're gonna be screening a surprise horror film and we're also gonna mm -hmm. be hosting a costume contest. So make sure you're doing your horror trivia homework and you're dusting off your sickest Halloween costume and get ready for our first ever Chilloween party. Dude, I am stoked for that. And you know, I, I, I don't know why, but I got this crazy urge to make me a banh mi sandwich that night. What do you think? It might be a banh mi kind of night. Do it. I'm going to make banh mi sliders so I can eat them mm. all night long. You know what? That might dominate the conversation, though. I guess that's fine. It'll be fine. <laughs> Indeed. It wouldn't be the first time. Probably no, not the last. Uh, I think that's all we got for housekeeping. you have anything you want to add there, Randu? Oh, just this. Pumpkins. As usual. <laughs> as usual thank you sir all right let's go ahead and get into the main event we're talking about jack o we're kicking it off you never allow Dude, me to clean house <laughs> i uh i'm in i i don't know i gotta get my head out of my ass dude your house sir. has not been you, you're you got hoarder syndrome it's, going on your so house filthy. is so filthy god damn i'm ashamed what's on the back of the box <laughs> I'm a premature bumper, you might have noticed tonight. <laughs> yeah, no worries. No worries. It's just all uh, that Jack O. Jack O. We're jacked up on Jack O tonight, courtesy of Matt G. Uh, this movie is from 1995. Runtime of an hour. It. Yeah, it does. Runtime of an hour, 28 minutes. Um, this was directed by Steve Latshaw, stars Linnea Quigley, uh, Madison K. Crown, Gary Doles. And also, uh, it's got some other folks that are like not well. John Carradine and Cameron Mitchell are in it, kind of. We'll oh, get yes. into all of that. Yes. <laughs> um, 
plot synopsis is as follows. Um, I've got the box, but there is not a plot on the back on the back of the box. So I'm not well, you got the collection. I guess that's fine. Yeah, the Jacko and Friends collection on DVD. <laughs> and Friends. And Friends. So the uh, plot brought to you by IMDb says, A long, long time ago, a wizard was put to death, but he swore vengeance on the townsfolk that did him in, particularly Arthur Kelly's family. Arthur had done the final braces on him when he came back to life as Mr. Jack the Pumpkin Man. The Kellys proliferated through the years, and when some devil-may-care teens accidentally unleashed Jack-O, young Sean Kelly must stop him somehow as his suburban world is accosted and the attrition rate climbs. Well, thank you, IMDb. That is, did you say something about racism in there, or did I mishear you? <laughs> no, I did not say anything about uh, it racism. It really sounded like you said, and he must, like, I don't know, there was something in there that sounded like racism. But doesn't at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this movie, man, this, yeah, this movie is not well, like filled with actors. So I guess to speak to your, your talk about actors, Linnea Quigley is by far the biggest name in this thing. So that is very, very true. Uh, Randu, had you seen this movie before, would you recommend people check it out? Absolutely not. This is actually a very difficult movie to see. Right. I mean, Jesus Christ, the fact that you own a hard copy is, is, fucking herculean as far as i'm concerned it was hard enough to find any legitimate stream and it was available on amazon for the paltry sum of two dollars because it is the most sd thing i have ever witnessed i don't know how it looks on your your dvd but my god it looks like it was directly pulled off of a vhs player um so yeah uh i would not recommend this film um I would say that if you had a good time with Birdemic and you want the Halloween version of that, but less interesting, you might do okay. But otherwise, this is not a movie for for anybody, really. Gotcha. Yeah, this was a first time launch for me. I'd been familiar with this movie, um, but I didn't know that it was filmed in Apopka, Florida, which is like just north of Orlando. So that definitely like piqued my interest. Um, uh, and I, I was pretty excited to watch it. So I did, as Randy mentioned, I, I picked up this uh, DVD copy of it and it's got three movies on it. It's got Dark Universe, Biohazard 2, and Jacko. And it's called Jacko and Friends. And um, other than this DVD, you can only get it on VHS as far as physical copies go. But yeah, I mean, you can rent it on Amazon for two bucks. So it's pretty pretty easy to find there. Um, I recommend watching this movie, but not because really? it's necessarily it's not a good movie it's it's, okay it's got like some really great pumpkins halloween yeah it's got some great pumpkins it's got some great halloween aesthetics to it Mm -hmm. and it's it's got some like early 90s charm this is this was a movie that was shot and went like straight to video um and apparently that's where most people saw it was like you know video rental stores on vhs i think it did show on tv as well I don't um, know how, unless they, I mean, they had to cut Linnea Quigley almost halfway down out of this film. <laughs> yeah, no shit. But uh, it's it's got some, like, early 90s charm to it, and it's got some interesting lore, and, like, the creature is fun. It's just, it's like a big, dumb, fun movie. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I will say, like, if you are interested in purchasing physical media, I cannot recommend enough buying this DVD of Jacko and Friends. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to, I want to, I want to mention Qualify this at the top. That, I will, yeah. I'll, I want to talk about it at the top because we're going to get into it uh, throughout the show. So there is a commentary track uh, on this disc for Jacko, and it, it it's between the director and executive producer. Um, it's uh, Steve Latshaw, who is the director, and the um, the executive producer is Fred Olin Ray. And they really lay into each other. Like it's the commentary starts off, starts off pretty amicably, and, but you can tell there's like some tension going on, and they start taking some digs at each other. And as the thing progresses, it's it's like more dramatic than the movie itself is. And he was it's married it, to the by, beast. <laughs> it's the best commentary track I've ever heard in my life. I can't <laughs> recommend it enough. I really can't. Like, I want to qualify like, this myself because you started texting me when you started watching this and you just didn't stop texting me about it. And I, I was know. so desperate to see this thing now. 
I was doing some last minute research for this movie. Like I, I finished this commentary like 30 minutes ago. Like I just finished it. If I had like finished it in midweek, I would have mailed you this disc so you could have watched it, man. Like I, it is worth it. Damn. I don't know how they released it. How did this get put out? I don't, <laughs> like, I don't Dude, know. That is literally the exact question you could ask about every single fucking facet of this film. So yeah, that's, that's true. I don't know. Why would I the commentary it. be any different? I recommend it, but it, just know it's like not necessarily a great movie. I don't think it's necessarily a bad movie. But it's not. It is not great. Um, it's yeah, so yeah. Qualifying. It's, I mean, you're right to say that it's got some some Halloween's ha- Halloween vibes to it, and it does have just the slightest bit of like nostalgia to it. But for yeah. me anyway. But it's like it's hyper specific nostalgia to the point where like like the lead kid in this movie is about our age at that time. So like, there's a little, and it's from our neck of the woods. So it just kind of seems like maybe yeah, like yeah, an unfair amount of nostalgia that nobody else is necessarily going to have. That's probably um, true. It's also got Linnea in it, and you know, if you're like a horror buff, it's always cool to see her in something. And this is like well, if you're a Halloween centric, Halloween centric movie Qu- that's like Quim-Pritist. off the beaten beaten path. You know, so that's yeah. it's got some some worth there anyway. Anyway. That's our recommendations. Let's go ahead and drop the spoiler warning and we're going to get into the rest of this movie. Here we go. Spoiler warning. (laughs) Oh boy. All righty then. What do we say? What do we say? What do we do? I do have a plot synopsis typed up. I'll go ahead and blast through this and uh, then we'll talk about it. So the movie opens up with little Sean Kelly hearing about the legend of his ancestors burying the evil pumpkin Jack. We see the events happen in a flashback and then we jump into present day 1995 and we see three kids throwing rocks at a car. Uh, Vivian driving the car. She gets out, she walks over and she sort of Uh, helps protect little Sean Kelly from uh, these other two kids. They're kind of bullying him. She ends up walking him home. Uh, Vivian, which is important to know, is a complete stranger who very quickly Mm -hmm. befriends the Kelly family and agrees to help them with their home haunt on Halloween night. Uh, Miss Kelly. Very quickly. And it's really a matter of like three sentences. Yeah, it's it's immediate. It's a given. It's like they're best friends and they always have. Yeah. Miss Kelly then calls up Carolyn, who's like a teenager, and she asks him to ask her to take a Sean out trick treating because uh, uh, they're going to be busy running the haunt and then she can't do it herself. Uh, she agrees to do so until 10 p.m., at which point she has a party to attend and her sister Julie will take over. Uh, three teens find the old Oakmore graveyard. They remove a wooden cross, which awakens Pumpkin Jack. Uh, they are all slaughtered. Sean then has a dream where he sees Vivian and she's related to an old warlock. This is confirmed to be true when Vivian shows up the next day with a family Bible and it has a picture of the warlock in it. Uh, warlock's name is Walter Machen. Uh, Vivian shares that Walter was accused of witchcraft in 1915. Before he was hung, he swore revenge um, and he took his revenge in the, uh, the form of the evil Pumpkin Jack, uh, who was eventually stopped by the Kelly's ancestors. Uh, Carolyn takes Sean trick-or-treating while Julie and her boyfriend Jim drink beer in the woods. Sean's parents run the home haunt until Mr. Kelly gets a call from a concerned parent saying their kids saw some dead bodies. The Kellys and Vivian then go out to find Sean and Carolyn. Vivian says only the fifth Kelly descendant can kill Pumpkin Jack. Oh yeah, it's a prophecy. Which is Sean Kelly. So Sean is the only one that can can kill Pumpkin Jack. That's Uh, the prophecy. That's it. That's the one. Pumpkin Jack kills Jim, knocks out Carolyn, and starts burying Sean in a grave very slowly with his scythe. Uh, Vivian is killed. Sean has a flashback of his descendant stabbing Pumpkin Jack with a wooden cross. Sean holds up the wooden cross while his father shoves Pumpkin Jack into it. Pumpkin Jack explodes. Uh, Julie, Carolyn, and the Kelly family meet back up and head off to have a lovely breakfast the following morning. Roll credits. Well, and But then there's a Jacko head that starts lighting back up as if I I was oh man true yeah can I tell For you sequel, of all sequel. of all the crimes that this movie commits and it is ample um an ample amount I would say that the editing is just so fucking confusing in this movie this is not a com- really a complex story but the editing really makes it kind of feel like it is 
I don't know if you felt that having to write the synopsis, I was sitting there like, God damn, who, who is this now? Like they introduced so many fucking characters and there's like at least two Judd Nelsons in this movie. Like there's two Judd Nelsons and a Tia Carrere and they kick things off without names. <laughs> yeah, this is a movie. Like if you want to fully understand what's happening in this movie, you do have to kind of pay close attention to it. And at the end of the day, it's not a very complex plot. It's just how they choose to like put the information on screen for you. It's not very linear. You get like a couple like info dumps, mm -hmm. but like there, there, there's like a sentence here and a sentence there. Like if you don't latch onto very quickly, like you might be a little confused as you see what's going on. Well, and then there's shit like, okay. And I know I realized that this was like an intentional moment of confusion later, but it's like too fucking confusing. When um, Sean is walking into his house at one point, like at early in the film. This is when we get to see, um, what's his name? Carradine, I believe. Uh, he walks into his house from the, the outdoors where it's sunny and where it, it, like Viv Vivian and his dad are talking about the ha haunting house or whatever their haunted house that he's putting together. He walks inside and it's, he walks into a front door and on the other side is a little lobby side area, a little foyer, and then an outside door leading to a darkened outside forest. And he like, I, like when that happened, I was like, what just happened? Did they just cut an entire scene out of this? Is there just like, did they just remove an establishing shot? What the fuck is happening? And it turns out he's having some sort of like vision or dream or whatever. Yeah. I think it's a dream. Yeah. But like that kind of shit happens all the time in this movie and not and like i don't know like it feels like there's probably two or three d dream sequence moments in this or things that they chalk up to dream sequences and i really just think it's like uh how do we get from a to b just fucking call it a dream sequence and we'll be done <laughs> do you get that sense what do you think about that yeah it's it's a little jarring and I think some of that is due to the fact that when they made this movie, they had pre-existing footage of mm -hmm. John Carradine and Cameron Mitchell. And the, the they were past at this point. Well, I think so. John Carradine was like eight years gone, I think. I don't know mm -hmm. if Mitchell was dead at the time of the release of this movie, but he definitely did not shoot any new footage for this movie. No, that's for that's for damn sure. I think um, they both were posthumous in this, but like at least that's what I read. And and like Carradine, like that footage of Carradine, it's supposed it's integrated into the film as if it's like happening in the film. It's like it's not like like um the other one where it's it's like an insert on a TV, you know, where so, you can say like, but the quality is severely worse. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Carradine it's so is, noticeable is the he's playing the warlock and there's like a green light over his face and it it looks like they took footage from another movie but apparently like the footage used in the in this movie of both of those actors was never used in any other movie it was just like literally footage they had laying around and the producer was like put this shit in this movie so we can put their names yeah so just for the name recognition is really why um uh, i don't know if that worked for him or not maybe it did i, I don't know but it, it'd be weird to see this movie coming out like if you were a big like fan of john carradine and you knew he died eight years ago and then fucking jack o comes out like yeah would you be stoked to see it or be like fuck these guys you know? i mean I, I might be until i saw it <laughs> yeah it's very oh, forced that it's, was a mistake um, yeah 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 that shit was filmed in the 80s and it really shows quality wise like if nothing else like you take everything else about it outside and disregard it it is noticeably different f film quality. <laughs> and it's like, it, it's, that's why I like compare this movie to Birdemic. That is the only movie I've seen that seems comparably incapable at doing basic things about filmmaking. This movie is better than, than Birdemic is. It does have like, it doesn't have any sitting on top of your dash cam footage. Um, but it, it does like, it does really fucking hokey and like bad things that I feel like, there's a little bit of a charm to it. I must say like, there's a little bit of a charm to the fact like this seems scrappy. You know what I mean? This feels like, like, yeah, like yeah. the, the residents of rainy street on King of the Hill, putting together a, a horror movie, you know? Yeah. The, the footage they used. Except of, Lydia Quigley's there. <laughs> the, the footage they used of Carradine was shot for a movie called cannibal church, which they ended up not using. And the footage they shot of Cameron Mitchell was supposed to be in a, to be in a movie called terminal shock, but I guess ended up not being in that. 
Uh, yeah, they had Quigley on set for three days and they just like, I guess, shot everything they could with her within three days. It feels like pretty well established, like her character is well established, like throughout the Better than this most, movie. actually. Yeah. 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 Um, that might have something to do with her being like a little more on the professional side of things. Like she'd done a shitload of, of movies, you know. Um, well, she, like, she was an actor. I feel like there were a lot of non-actors yeah. in this movie. Like, even, like, yeah. you expect that with yeah. the kids. But I feel like maybe the dad and, like, um, I don't know who else. Like, like both Judd Nelson seemed like non-actors to me. Uh, Malenia's sister seemed like a non-actor to me. The fucking Walton couple, the Walton, was it Waltons? I think so. Um, talking about the like super the, the Republican, hyper, yeah, the hyper conservative, like, conservative, like, TV yeah, consumers. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like I watching, love like, those pro- characters, dude. They were pretty funny, and it's clear that they were like intentionally funny, but it was like, yeah, yeah, it, it was almost quaint seeing what <laughs> seeing uh, a yeah. social critique on um, very conservative, people conservative and, yeah. talk radio types because now it's compared like, to now yeah yeah it's so much that, more insidious now <laughs> the uh, the producer definitely intended that to be like a playoff rush limbaugh that like oh, the talking yeah. head on the tv i love that shit because they're like they got the microwave uh tv dinners and it's like this gnarly ass salisbury microwave. steak like it looks <laughs> disgusting <laughs> Yeah, it does look bad. And they're, <laughs> they're also like like insanely over the top, like like evil, like, well, not evil, but like just petty fuck bags. Like when trick or treaters come to your, their door, yeah. first thing uh, the guy does is he says, You didn't turn off the porch light. And she's like, Must I do everything? And he says, Yes. And then he goes and answers it and yells at the kids that if they want candy, they got to pay for it and all this shit. And it's like, nobody's that fucking evil or <laughs> shitty to kids on Halloween. And if they are, like, they don't then immediately go inside and expect nothing to happen. Like, of course you're going to get TP'd. Of course you're going to have shit on, like, people fucking with you. Like, yeah. I, don't know. I, I, I love that sequence where he's like, if you want candy from me, you're going to buy it. Yeah. Like, get the fuck out of here, man. Yeah, the only like, characters that you see like that in, in, in most Halloween stuff are people like uh, weirdly like in King of the Hill they have one like this that's like a hyper religious like like this is a satanic holiday sort of thing like people that are morally religiously opposed to it um, for better or for worse that's those are the people that get to act like assholes in Halloween movies a lot of the time but yeah. not just like people like a, a dude is just like so hyper like libertarian ass he's like you better work for that can it's like this is fucking halloween dude no handouts never... around here kid yeah exactly the no handout thing. It's, it's so like it, it the thing is it might be one of the more clever things in this movie which is sh- just showing how low the bar is for cleverness here <laughs> yeah yeah those uh those two characters were based off real people uh that i guess the director lived next to somewhere oh God, he just in orlando <laughs> which is unsurprising to hear oh is that how believable is that? Yeah. Oh, boy. Uh, regarding the uh, some of the other casts, now it's it you kind of feel like they're probably not very seasoned actors. Something kind of pretty interesting happened regarding the casting of this movie. Um, the uh, uh, the Donahue show in the '90s they had a scream queen contest on there, I guess. Really. And yeah they had three judges and um fred olin ray the executive producer of this movie was one of the judges uh barbara felden was a judge and joe bob briggs was a judge oh shit and they uh i guess there was a bunch of girls that were having trouble sort of like breaking into the business and um they they auditioned uh on this donahue show and kelly lacy who ends up playing the character of shannon ended up winning um, so she's in this movie and hypothetically it's like her first movie so, role. I think she did like is, one is thing. Is that Lania Quigley's but... sister? Who is that? Um, it's, yeah, I think so. Shannon. Yeah. I think that's, that's... the only like young no, woman besides Julie. Julie I can think of. It's another, it's one of the teens. One of oh, the teens. oh, she was probably, she was probably the Tia Carrere dressed fucking Judd Nelson third at the beginning that took the, uh, cross out of the ground. I, I would think that's the only other like young woman I can think of from this film is, is those three. And I, we know it's she, not Linnea. She obviously didn't leave much of an impression. 
Yeah. So. Well, a very little. This movie kind of slides off the dome on, in a lot of ways. It, it can do that. It can do that. I don't know about you, but I did fall asleep uh, at least once during this film and had to rewind. <laughs> um, oh no! Yeah, I didn't fall asleep at all uh, watching this movie. But I also like I don't know. I was just awake. I wasn't tired at all. But like I don't know. Regarding you mentioned earlier how this was sort of like re- reminiscent of Plan Nine from Outer Space because they sort of like stitch in a bunch of like pre-existing oh, yeah. stuff to to beef it up and the the producer i guess was giving this interview in fangoria when it came out and he referred to it as plan nine from out of state which i think is pretty fantastic <laughs> out of state sure well i mean that's that's a play on plan nine from outer space but i have no idea what that's supposed to mean in a literal sense i assume because it's out was of a, state about it it's a florida production and it wasn't shot in california is what i was assuming oh, it okay yeah that does make sense then. okay all right got it that is clever yeah i like it <laughs> it also had speaking like if you are familiar at all with the orlando area it had its world premiere at the enzian theater which i thought was pretty badass even that's though it's awesome. not like the best movie in the world that's pretty cool that's a uh, damn good theater <laughs> yeah yeah they play good shit that it's not always they don't just play jacko there in case you want to check it out. <laughs> what a shame. <laughs> Round the clock Jacko, and they missed out on that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I don't know, man. There, I, I was sitting there watching this movie, and I was like, I'm going to struggle to have stuff to say about this, except to compare it to things like Birdemic and Plan 9 and stuff. This is, like, clearly a bad movie, right? Like, like on its base level. The question I was confronting with was how enjoyable is it? Because I, that is the only thing that can really sway a bad movie into a positive score for me, um, which obviously we're, I'm not yeah. asking for your score or anything like that, but I was having trouble even doing that much with some of this. I feel like maybe if it was a, like, this is another one of those cases where if it was, I was in a room with you guys or with, with other people, it could definitely have benefited from that. Did you get that sense as well? Yeah, I definitely think so. It's, the movie's not like quite bombastic enough to hold your attention, such as a birdemic would be. Um, it does, it's got a lot of atmosphere, like I mentioned, and it actually reminded me quite a bit of Pumpkinhead. This is like, because there is a another like vengeance demon in this movie, just like in Pumpkinhead, but the demon actually has a pumpkin for a head, unlike yeah. Pumpkinhead does. So it kind of delivers on the, yeah. the title in a way that Pumpkinhead never did. And there's a witch that's kind of forced into it, you know? Uh, but I think this would be served uh, to watch in a group setting and not necessarily on your own because it's a little, it's, it's, it's like, like you said, yeah, it's kind of forgettable, I guess. Kind of forgettable. It's like, I think it's because like, like it, I think, that, I mean, this movie has kills in it. It like, mm-hmm. Birdemic didn't have as many, as much of that going on as it did like really dumb shit. Like, I don't know, like fucking hanging out with your family or whatever. Like there's a lot of, or there's not a non not not insignificant amount of like what would qualify as gore and stuff like that, and you would think that would hold your attention, but I honestly think that the way it's edited so confusingly and the way that the story is like is confusingly relayed makes it harder to focus on. <laughs> like you don't even have like like in Birdemic, you get it, it's like okay, so there's birds attacking people, got it, and you can focus on that one aspect and be good. And this one, it's like, okay, a pumpkin headed guy is chasing people, but they like so much of it is dedicated to the why, the how, all that stuff. And it's not engaging really. And it's confusing. Yeah, there's, there's like some interesting stuff they inject in, into the lore. Like at the beginning, it's got a very like John Carpenter's The Fog vibe where uh, Sean's mm-hmm. sitting around campfire hearing about this evil Jacko and there's even like a little nursery rhyme kind of thing like Mr. Jack will break your back cut off your head with a whack 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 and it goes on and on that's That's like pretty interesting you know I agree like that's that's I mean it's a little paint by numbers but it's fine it would work fine and on like just saying oh they have a crazy nursery rhyme they make up that sounds kind of menacing and like that all that all is fine that's by numbers but it's fine the problem is that like at least with that part is I'm pretty sure that later on there's another fucking nursery rhyme or something. I think they do like three different things with it. It seems Apparently like it's like, long as fuck. Yeah. 
I guess, but they act like it's a pre-established thing. I have no idea. Maybe it is, and those are just like lines from the thing that like, that seem disparate because they're it's like super long. Like you said, but to me, it just seemed like they were like occasionally like like one character will start reciting stuff. I'm like, what the fuck are they talking? Oh, is this this isn't the same rhyme though? What is happening? They should have they could have just stuck with like two or three lines that are menacing, and made callbacks instead of confusing fucking i think they're trying to make callbacks to that thing but it's really just strikes more as a non sequitur to something else entirely or like an entirely different spooky thing to say that doesn't yeah. really hang together with what's going on i don't know that I, shit was weird <laughs> i enjoy i did enjoy that even if it was a little like inconsistent i also got a kick out of like the parents like sean's parents like getting really into setting up their like home haunt okay, in the was... garage and the dad's like hanging a little banner and he's got like crazy amounts of fog rolling and he's got one of those old school little like things you hang from mm-hmm. the ceiling that's like motion activated and it makes a crazy wild Ooh. noise yeah it's like a witch and yeah shit. and like and they I'll, do the I'll fucking, love that. that is like the most rinky dink and they kept calling it spook house which i am like yeah i guess that's a common phrase but i've never heard it called that just like a haunted house like it's a spook house. That just seems kind of old timey. I, I didn't hate that. I just thought that was kind of kind of unique. But um, they also do the thing with like the eyeballs, the guts that are grapes, yeah. and spaghetti, and all that stuff. And it's like, man, this is like the world's rinkiest, dinkiest fucking ha- haunted house. And, and like, there was something kind of charming about that, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, you're not that into fucking Halloween, dog. Like, I don't buy it. <laughs> I, don't, I don't buy it. I want it to. Like, it seemed like. Okay, like a dad that's like hyper into Halloween, uh, the mom that's hyper into Halloween, and they they do this thing or whatever. You would think that that would be great for a movie that's centered on Halloween, like this is supposed to be and is for the most part. But it just seems like, and I think it's budgetary. Like it's clear, it's got to be budgetary that they couldn't do like an actual kind of like haunted house even on a small scale. I've been to haunted houses that people do in their garage. Even the like bad ones are more than fucking spaghetti and grapes. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we had this guy in the neighborhood when I was a kid, and he he wouldn't make like a haunted house in his garage. He'd just open up the door and he'd fill it with fog. And he had this like really badass gorilla costume that was like head <laughs> head to toe, and he'd put that on. And he built like a little cage for himself, and he'd like crawl inside of it. And he'd have like you know fog and strobe. <laughs> he'd make noises like that. And when kids would walk by, he'd like run out of the cage after him down the street and scare the shit out of him. It was pretty that's badass. Amazing. It's simple. That's amazing. Simple, but yeah, yeah, that's really simple. And like I've been to things like where people go all out, like like somewhat all out, not like McCamey Manor shit, but yeah. like like you know, relative like people like they have a storyline to their fucking thing where it's like, oh, my kids are playing the scientist that unleashed a zombie horde, and now there's zombie children chasing you, and they're pinned up. Oh no, they escape. Like. They're trying. They're trying real hard. And I just it's hard for me to sit here and be like, yeah, this guy really gets the spirit of Halloween because he set up fucking grapes. (laughs) He's trying. He's a dad in a movie filled with nothing believable. That might be the least believable part. (laughs) There was this really awkward scene between the dad and Quigley where she's like, oh, my God, complimenting him on his like his childlike wonderment. And he's like, oh, well, thank you. And she's like, yeah. I like little boys. It's Dude, like that whole weird. scene is, they're really trying to tap into like they're like Lenny Quigley has her 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 reputation as a sex pot in movies or whatever. Like that's like like there is there is a nude scene that goes beyond shameless in this movie of her where I mean, like I don't know, but like those sort of things they're 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 using her for that. Like I think that they kind of like back off of that when when she gets around the kids, thank God. But like they do that and then he does this thing where the kid's like oh look at the cool bi- motorcycle can i go look and he says look son and then he looks over at Linnea and he goes but don't touch like he's desperately tempted by this woman and yeah. she's just sitting there smiling at him with her Linnea quigley face and it's like i don't know i appreciated it but at the same time i was like this movie's too stupid to support this i feel like this is a movie that could be for kids but it can't be because there's so much Linnea quigley titty in this yeah so regarding the like very unnecessary amount of nudity in this movie like so we're we're like introduced to quigley's character in the shower naked it's lingering it's unnecessary it's uncomfortable they do a Um, cutaway like she's like facing it's kind of like 
oh, you see her from one side in profile almost. And then she turns to face the other way to go into the other profile. And as they do that, they cut to a close up one shot of both boobs as they turn to the other side and then cuts back out. It's like one second of just boob shot. It's just like nothing but, and they do that with the other girl too. So I want to, I want to mention this commentary real quick regarding this oh my sequence. God, please do. So like uh, the director, <laughs> Steve Latshaw, whenever this pops up on the commentary, he's like, yeah, I mean, you introduced to the character when she's naked in the shower. And he's like, you know, I, I called you talking to the executive producer, Fred Olin Ray. He's like, I called you, Fred. And I was like, you know, I don't know if this is really the best way to handle this character. I mean, you're introduced to her and she's naked on screen. And his res- his response apparently was like, as it should be. He was just like all about it. And like, oh like there's obviously a lot of resentment uh Uh, from the director about that scene being in there and like Linnea just like being so unnecessarily naked as she was in a lot of movies but still it's it's super cringy in this movie it is very cringy it's like it's so like like uh, there's no pretense to it whatsoever like there's nothing about it that isn't just we want to see this woman's boobies her yabos and we're going to allow you to see them for an extended period of time You paid the admission cost. We owe you some nice boobies and that's it. Like there's nothing. I mean, it's, it's, it's unpretentious. And in in some ways I'm kind of respect that, but on the other side of things, it's like, this is, this movie like is maybe only suitable for Halloween viewing for you and your kids. You know what I mean? Until you get to that. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that during the the commentary that's the first time the two of them say they are done with each other after they're done with the commentary like oh my god they say it several what do they times, say exactly like you gotta relay this like g- g- give me a s- set the scene and go they're they're um so the movie starts off and they're saying some interesting stuff particularly mm-hmm. the, the director Lashaw saying some interesting stuff about how like the um arthur Machen, like the warlock's character was like named after this writer with the last name of Machen, who is similar to hp lovecraft um apparently like the the main house in the movie was literally steve latshaw's house that's like where he lived that with shows. his family <laughs> um Very much his, shows his son is playing the little boy in the movie. So like he and his family are like very personally entwined in the making of this movie. And like, you can tell that Latshaw is sort of like, he's proud of the movie, but he's not like boastful. And he's, he's not under the illusion that that, that this is like an incredible film. I think he just kind of gets a little extra flack for some of the decisions that he was forced to make by the executive producer. And there's some tension that obviously is between them. And like, as, as it starts, you think it's because of that explicitly. And then as it develops, they start taking digs at each other's craft more and more. And then they start (laughs) taking digs at each other's families. And it becomes extremely personal. The last like 20 (laughs) minutes of this commentary latshaw like fucking leaves he fucking gets up and leaves like, catch you fuckers at a bad time uh, I, uh what are they i got i have that sounds so, amazing i don't know I why so that's not notes. it why is that not available for for immediate viewing i need to see this shit that, i mean like, uh, the fact oh my god this is this is like this is a Florida man movie, is it not? Uh, I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> label it like that. There's okay. I'm trying to find this one quote. I have so many notes. It's hard to like read and also like relate. It's just got what that salaciousness to, to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's like one review of this where I guess somebody calls calls the movie like a shit pickle. I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I guess a that shit was pumpkins. like a shit pickle. And apparently that was like a really, really sore spot for the director. And a, like it was agreed upon that before they do this commentary together, the producer would not bring up that review. Like he oh made him agree to it and he brought it up towards the end anyway. And he that that was the breaking point where he's like, 
fuck you, dude. I'm getting out of here. Um, but that then he ends hilarious. up coming back. He does come back a couple minutes later. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to let you totally fuck up this commentary. Like, I'm going to finish this thing out regardless, you know. And he does. And he tries to, like, throw in a couple extra, like, interesting tidbits and shit. And then at the very end, <laughs> um, the, the producer is like, He's like, you know what, man? Like, we've been friends out here for a long time. We've done a lot of work together. And the director's like, no, man, we've been acquaintances out here. And the producer's like, okay, well, then fuck you. <laughs> and the director's like, fuck you, too. And that's literally the end of the commentary and the credits roll. That's that how is, it ends. That is so much better than this movie. Why, why am I missing out on this? It, there's the drama is palpable between these two. It is there's a hidden nuts. Jerry Springer episode in this fucking movie. There is, man. I I couldn't believe it. I can't believe they put this shit out, man. Uh, there's <laughs> yeah. like the producer said. I have so many quotes. I have so many fucking quotes. The producer <laughs> is like, you know, Roger Corman expects his directors to take a certain amount of responsibility for what you turn in. And uh, Fred was like, yeah, but at least you have Roger Corman stories to tell afterwards. <laughs> he's, he's like so fucking salty. Um, oh I don't know, God. man. It's, they say it's over several, several times. And there's like, so I guess they, they got back together to do this commentary, which was specifically for this DVD that I have. And the producer is like, <laughs> he's like, you know what? Who the hell else would be putting this thing out other than me? He's like, nobody would do it, man. Like, that's why you're here. We're here to put this movie out. We're here to put your movie out, even though it's been called a shit pickle. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, he's he's trying to do him a solid. Obviously, it's like a cash no. grab. Like, it's the only Dude, reason he's doing yeah. it. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm doing you a solid. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You're fucking welcome. <laughs> uh, damn. Damn. That is so entertaining. The, the so these both both these guys kind of feel like cooters. The I will say, the producer is like extra fucking cootery. He <laughs> says shit like you know don't drink and drive because hell you might spill the drink. <laughs> and he's like, he's the one that like insisted Quigley was like nude in the movie and like yeah! you needed to introduce her that way. And he there's like this one sequence in the movie where. I can't remember. There's like teens like making out in a bed. And he's like, oh, there's that famous Fred Olin Ray bed. I guess it was like literally his bed. And he's like, man, the the long list of actresses I could tell you that have been laid down in that bed. He's like, hell, I thought about auctioning that bed off on eBay. Like you wouldn't believe Jesus. the names. It's just, it's pretty cringeworthy, uh, man. I hate that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, it, somewhere towards the middle after like after the producer like really making some digs at this movie he turns around and he's like he's like you know what man like i i think this is actually one of your best movies and oh the my- like what the fuck do you mean by that like you just spent 45 minutes telling me it's shit basically it's it's pretty rough Dude. um oh man there That's- was something there, there was like some interesting ideas going on regarding the promotion of this movie though some of it already mentioned like the donahue shit mm-hmm. um in addition to the like fangoria interview there was also like a uh jack lantern carving contest in which you would carve your shit you'd send in a picture to fangoria and linnea, linnea quigley would actually judge and she like picked her favorite i don't know what the, the prize was necessarily <laughs> yeah. but there's a contest going on with that which is kind of neat um uh it's sort of not surprising to hear that uh the producer fred owen ray was a broadcaster at a christian radio station in apopka florida when he was younger my god <laughs> yeah. my god this is uh, how are you how you i mean you don't want to put the label of florida man near this you don't <laughs> no i don't like the stigma i think that's kind okay. of bullshit because dumb people do shit in every state so no people that's think true i mean florida he- is dumb because florida man is dumb Dude, you don't have to like convince me, but at the same time, like the, the fucking the Crocs fit, baby. They fit. Well, these people both live in California now. Well, I mean, so that should have that's like they have producers like and directors years. fighting in California. Unbelievable. Yeah, California Unbelievable. man. California man says says from waitress to diva. Thank you, Fred Olin Ray. What a shitty thing to say. Dude. Like, <laughs> 
Oh um, my god. Yeah, I totally hijacked the conversation, and I apologize. Dude, I'm glad. No, it's fine because it like this movie's kind of tough to dig into. Like, the, yeah, it's got some interesting lore. Oh, I did want to praise one thing. The like the thing that kept me really interested about this movie was, or that kept that 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 brought interest for me was the actual pumpkin head. I thought it looked pretty good mm. for being a low budget thing. What did you think of that? Yeah, yeah, I thought it was a pretty cool design, and uh-huh. like the uh, the eyes being sort of like reflective material was pretty mm. neat. And obviously, it makes sense that he would kill people with a scythe. You know that that's like very very fitting. Um, and I I really don't have any complaints. I mean, it obviously looks kind of low budget and cheesy, but I think that works in the movie's favor. I don't think that's a negative necessarily. Yeah, I mean, it's by far the best quality thing in the movie, as it should be, as it should be. Like, it should be the most, like, well, I mean, in terms of, uh, of actual physical items, that's the most impressive thing in the movie, I would say. And, you know, the kills are, are, are tough cells. You can see people pushing fucking mm-hmm. squibs out of the they're in out of their hand on out their of their hand. asses out of their asses no but like you can and like the one dude one of the judd nelsons gets a scrape across his face like claws and it's just like the streaks of ketchup across his face sort of look yeah and you know like it's not good but you know it's a it's a low budget movie you just kind of take your lumps with it but with the mask i felt like they really kind of transcended their budget a little bit and it's the only thing in this movie that feels that way yeah i don't know what the budget was for this it was obviously very very small and that's one of the many things they bitch They're about in the during, guy's house during the commentary I it's pretty yeah. small they apparently they bought all the pumpkins that you see in this movie in the month of november and they didn't start filming until february march of the following year so they just like had to shellac all the pumpkins and yeah. the, the poor man had to store all that shit in his garage. And he was like, you know, it worked fine. But if, if you put in, if you applied any pressure to one of the pumpkins, it would just cave and you just smell like rotting garbage. Like, Ugh. yeah, pretty gnarly. That's no good, man. That's no bueno. Yeah, I don't know, man. So like there's something like, like scrappy and fun about being able to make a movie like this at all. Yeah. And part of me was yeah. I kind of pulled for this movie. I wanted this movie to like really like like be as silly enjoyable as in a campy way as possible and i think maybe they were aiming for that in some ways but just it didn't it didn't really land for me in that way to me it's like it's like it's it's hammy in all the wrong places it wasn't bombastic enough to really hang a like a bunch of giggle fests on it but then again i haven't seen it with a group of friends i feel like that really that's really like the test for a campy movie and like there's so many of these movies that we have to review or have reviewed that they just don't get that test because we're not in the same state. Yeah. This, I do like some of like the goofy electric effects that they have going on. Like when the, uh, the oh, very conservative yeah. lady dies, that's probably my favorite kill. Oh, absolutely. And, like, I forgot about that. She just like, and it's not even a, a kill. That is a, yeah, that, is an, it's an that is a freak accident after a kill and pumpkin head just kind of watches. And after she's done electrocuting, he just kind of like, he kind of homers Tight. into the into Tight. the into the hedge. Just kind of. She like, I, I love how this whole scene is set up because they're having their gnarly Salisbury steak and like the the male character I can't remember his name. The the, the dude goes to answer the door Whoa. and he yells at the kids about how they can't get candy or whatever. And she's like, "Dear, do you want a second helping of toast?" And I was like, "God damn, you people eat a lot yeah. of toast." I'll make you some more toast. And they, yeah, th- okay, go ahead. I'm sorry, I cut you off. Please go. And she she's loading the toaster down and she she's buttering that shit up and, and slicing it up and she trips on a rug and she's still got the butter knife in her hand and she falls butter knife first into a toaster and gets electrocuted mm-hmm. to death. But like it's, it's got this really thing. cheesy overlay that looks like lightning happening all over her body. I mean, it's the same effect technically that they do in like Ghostbusters and shit like that. It's yeah, a matte painting. Yeah. But it's not done that well, obviously. And it's but it is done well. Like again, I think you're right. I forgot about that. And I would say that that rises uh, above that kind of floats to the top in terms of, of um quality in this movie. Yeah. Um yeah. but I will say like that whole scene, I loved I actually did kind of love the killing of her husband because he goes out and there's like all this toilet paper and he's has they've been rolled or whatever. And um or maybe there's I think something else happens, but like he hears the Jack Lantern guy, and he's like, ah, aren't you a little big for trick-or-treating? And then the thing kills him. And um, 
mean as he's getting stabbed in the gut or whatever or bleeding out of his mouth or whatever they're cutting between that and the lady buttering and cutting toast really meticulously yeah like the opening of dexter or some shit and i was like man this like it's clearly to my mind it's like well we can't sell the gore that much but we need to fill this out so we're gonna imply the gore via toast of all things like they could have had it be a roast or something they could have had it be something with blood in it but they chose fucking buttered toast. And I think it's because of their commitment, I guess, to making fun of his neighbors being like the most, like in the words of this movie, the most white bread of all time. Yeah, it's, it's pretty solid. There's another decent kill. Um, uh, Jim gets his head like chopped clean off and then Julie catches it as he's like rolling across oh, yeah. the ground. Freaks it's a real out. silent night, deadly night moment. Yeah, dude, it really is. Uh, that's a pretty solid kill. Those are the ones, those are like the two that really stand out in Most my mind. Most of them are just slices across the neck that you can buy yeah. the spirit, the ha- spirit of Halloween store. So, Yeah. That um, goofy ass sequence where like uh, Sean is getting buried with a scythe and it's taking four fucking ever. Yeah. He's, he's like, no. Oh my God. That ki- <laughs> The kid so actor, bad. like, I mean, he's not an actor. He's just like the actor's kid and all that stuff. So, I mean, you know it's fine i'm this kid is yeah, fine yeah, I, yeah. i'm not i'm not giving the kid shit except like he's not an actor and it very much shows because he's like he's slowly getting cut it's like watching that scene from austin powers where the guy's slowly about to get run over by the uh, fucking steamroller <laughs> he's like no except he's not even yelling loud he's like no no please please, <laughs> please no please no <laughs> it's like he's like this kid cannot cannot ramp it up at all like he just really shows nothing everything he says is very like read off a cue card but what's interesting is same is true of his dad his dad kind of seems like he's reading off cue cards too well they probably Uh, were man they probably were it's it's that thing where it's yeah it's that thing where it's like oh this is bad but is it entertaining and i can't i don't know i I have a hard time deciding yeah that that aspect of it i mean the uh when the kid goes trick-or-treating Somebody gives him like a little juice, like a little container. Dude, yeah, one of, of those juice. like little barrel juices. Yeah. What the fuck? Like, who hands those out on Halloween? I don't know, people what? get weird on Halloween. Like, that's. Thank I don't God. know. I remember getting. Fu- there were people that gave out toothbrushes like fucking monsters in our neighborhood mm. growing up. Yeah. Like, before. I- yeah. And that's. Like- I remember getting the little like Bible pamphlet. That was the worst. The chick tracks? Or was it- Is that what it's called? I don't know what it's called. The little comic book things, or it's like a yeah, yeah. yeah I definitely those are chick tracks most likely, and yeah, they're they're hilariously nuts. But I, I I definitely got a few of those growing up, um, in my in my Halloween bags, and that's the shit that's like, man, you are really asking for people to get mischievous on your house. I mean, kids are looking for an excuse. Mm-hmm. Give me a reason, reason to shit on your car, and I'll <laughs> give do me a it. reason to leave a dog shit in a bag in front of your house. And I, I'm, I'm, I have the dog shit in hand. It's just a matter of picking a target. Why put <laughs> that on your back? Give um, me a reason, you old bag. <laughs> pretty much, yes. Um, endless Mike style. So I don't know, man. It's just, I don't know. I don't know where I was going yeah. with that, really. But yeah, I lost. I don't know either. Way. Is it well? I mean, we can go and rate this thing, man. Is there anything else you want yeah. to touch on before we? No, do so? man. It's tough to think of a lot to say about this movie, so no. Okay, well, let's go ahead and do it. Out of five, how do you feel about Jack O? So, um, I, I mean, I've been pretty, pretty upfront about this. This is a bad movie, and really, what it comes down to is how enjoyable it is, um, as opposed to the quality of it. That's what happens with most camp movies, and and in our situation or at least my situation it's a little tough because i don't have a lot of like horror fan friends where i'm at um that can come over and we can all giggle at a bad movie together and enjoy campiness on that level i just like i don't have that resource here so for me it's just me kind of like nodding off because i can't even like crack jokes to somebody and have them crack jokes back and laugh back and forth about it so i'm missing that component of it i recognize that and i feel like this and a few other movies that we've talked about pretty recently would benefit from that greatly. And I may have to try it again at some point under that, under that rubric. But the experience that I had with this movie was I did not enjoy it. I like, I kind of liked the lore. I thought the mask looked good. I did like some of the effects and a couple of the kills, like a few things, like I said, rose to the top. They were the cream of this movie and they definitely seemed, there were only a handful of things that really kind of 
came out feeling like cinematic at all uh, on any level. And the rest really was like really bad acting, really like confusing, confusing as shit editing. And um, maybe an overburden of exposition that was part of the problem as well. And then like some of the actors themselves, like the, their performances are not just like wooden, like the lady who plays Vivian, like I think this is a character choice or whatever. She's like kind of like clearly trying to conceal stuff the whole time. So she's never like, she's rarely like just, you know, normal. <laughs> like she's rarely act. She's always looks like she's trying to convey that she's concealing something. And the way that she does that is by giving a face, like she's sniffing dog shit constantly through this whole fucking movie. She's got this, this dog shit sniff face. And I'm just like, ah, oh, man, this is cringy. And then the dad's like very wooden and he has the worst haunted house of all time. And we're supposed to buy him as, I don't know, all these things kind of like work in tandem to make it hard to focus on. And then also like an overabundance of characters. They didn't even fucking kill Linnea Quigley or Linnea Quigley's, Quigley's sister. Like I thought that everybody was going to be a red shirt except for the family, you know, and they, there were a surprising number of survivors in this movie. And it really didn't have to be that way. It really, like they really could have done with some paring down in general. Um, so overall, I, I don't, I didn't have the enjoyment factor to save this from itself. So for me, it's a 1.5. And a lot of that is because I really did like that mask a lot. And I also like, I still see some scrappiness in this. It's tough to make a movie at all. And it's tough to make a movie when you have no budget and you're having to film in your own house. There's something endearing about doing that. And it's, it's tough to ding somebody too hard for those sort of things when they're really coming at it from almost like, I don't want to say that amateur because that's maybe like a little little mean mean spirited sounding, but at least from an amateur level of budgeting, budgetary construct constraints. Excuse me, you know, I think they could have done better with maybe more budget, but they also had some severe lacking of prowess in just about every other category that really for me just did not really land in any way. I'm sorry to say. Right on. I feel pretty positive about this movie, even though it's not particularly fantastic. Um, I really dig the like Dr. Cadaver sequences, which was. Um, oh, yeah, we didn't even talk the, about uh, that. Yeah, the Cameron Mitchell like interstitials where he's like on the TV hosting like a horror show. Like, uh, I don't know. I, I dig that. He's like a, a goofy little horror host. Uh, the uh, super Republican uh, talking head on the TV, I thought was hilarious. Um, the the couple watching that were hilarious. The the to the toast death scene. Um, I dig a lot of the lore happening, even though it's a little like chopped up and unclear. And they made like a little nursery rhyme, which was was decent. Um, some of the kills were good. It's it's definitely got some like straight to video 90s charm that I vibe with. I just kind of like that aesthetic. Um, the parents are goofy. Uh, it's like a fun Halloween watch, but everything is noticeably like low budget and hurried. It feels very hurried and almost haphazard. Uh, and it really does detract from the enjoyment of the movie overall. Like there's no amazing performances in this movie, like at all. Um, I think they're just trying to make do with what they had. And like, I definitely appreciate that uh, sort of run and gun um, hustle that you, have, that you have to make, you have to have to make a movie like this. It's not easy to do. Um, and I definitely love, 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 love the commentary. I just can't recommend that enough. Please listen to that fucking commentary. We need, um, we need to get together and do that legit at some point because I, yeah. I, I'm more interested in seeing that than rewatching this movie and testing its metal uh, in in the camp factor. I want to see this fucking yeah. document, this commentary. I, I mean. This has a riff tracks to it, and I would like if I were going to show really? this movie to somebody, yeah, I, I would put this on and put the commentary on and be like, I don't even care what the riff tracks is. Like we're watching this fucking commentary, <laughs> it's nuts. Um, I think I'm going to give this a two point five, just wow. kind of right down, right down the middle with it. Yeah, yeah your enjoyment um, did a lot more than mine. I wonder what, how I would have altered if I had gotten the benefit of hearing that commentary. I don't know if that would have I would have factored that in or not, but 
hopefully we'll uh, we'll find out one day randu maybe uh soju did call in from prison he's got uh, uh, his thoughts pre- pre-recorded for us we're gonna go ahead and have a listen to what he thinks about jacko what up everyone it's your boy soju coming to you to talk about jacko sorry i can't be on the cast this week but i wanted to leave a little blurb uh, with my thoughts and overall score so the positives of this film is pretty much the vibes that it's got it's got really solid halloween vibes um like throughout the monster has a giant jack-o'-lantern pumpkin head um and it's halloween there's kids running around i like even kind of how it opens up a little bit telling a scary story around a campfire to a kid um like I said, the trick or treating, even the kids, you know, TP in a house, all those kind of things really worked well for me. It was a fun watch for this Halloween season, even though, spoiler, I don't think this movie is very good, but I don't regret watching it. And it was a fun watch since it is the spooky season. Um, it feels like older than it actually is it kind of reminded me of night of the scarecrow a little bit but much worse in its overall premise and acting and and craft i guess but it kind of reminded me of that but it was like came much later i think this was made sometime in the mid 90s yeah 1995 so it feels like even more dated than that honestly um the acting in this movie is terrible it's just really bad. There's so many laughable moments. It's it's not quite the level of Birdemic, but there were moments where it kind of reminded me of that. There's a scene where the boy is like laying in the grave and he's like mm. being <laughs> and the <laughs> creature is just like <laughs> slowly <laughs> raking dirt onto him and the kid just like no no <laughs> it's like the weakest fucking shit but everybody's like that it's not just because it's a kid pretty much everyone just does a flat flat job in this um the dialogue is just very basic um the lore i i don't know i kept going back and forth on it most of the time I felt like it was too much. I mean, you needed to make this pumpkin creature make some kind of sense. But adding in this kind of like warlock element, witch element, I don't know. I don't know. I just felt like it was kind of too much. And a lot of the scenes are just them sitting around explaining that. Of course, we do get the flashback scenes. That doesn't really help a whole lot either. Um, the scene with the, the kind of teenagers in the woods awakening him, I mean, that was pretty standard stuff. Um, it was, it was fun. Like the monster doesn't look good, but it looks fun. And, um, it was entertaining enough to see this like pumpkin creature rolling around slaughtering these teens and people in the town. Like that was fun enough. Um, Overall, though, I just don't think this is a great movie. It's it's a decent watch for Halloween, for sure. Certainly shouldn't watch it any other time. Um, but, like I said, I don't regret watching it. I had a fun enough time watching it. And love seeing all the spooky Halloween vibes. I really dug on that, actually. So, overall, I'm going to give this a 1.5. And of course, I am a man of principle here, so I am going to give half star for the Yabos. Of course, old Linnea Quigley, um, man, she had to make a ton of money off those Yabos because we just covered her last week showing Yabos. Um, so yeah, I'm going to give it a 1.5 with the half star for the Yabos. So overall, two for Shaboy Soju. All right. <laughs> The the Halloween vibes are are decent in this movie. I, I do want to agree with that. Like that's, yeah. I, to me, that's that is maybe that's maybe like the un, unspoken part that 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 I did like about it. So good call on that, dude. 
I was looking at the back of this fucking DVD I have, and I guess they, they did commentary tracks for all three of these movies, Dark Universe, Biohazard 2, and Jacko. And there's a fourth feature on this movie that's just not labeled on the front, and it's called Gator Babes. Oh, I saw oh. something about that. It's like a, a student film or something that he did, an early I film. don't know. I just like don't know. I got to watch all this. I got to listen to all these commentaries. This these physical do. media. Th- this is why you buy physical media. This is gold. This shit is gold. Uh, well, I, I don't. So that is not why. I, there's no change, reason. That I... <laughs> change your ways, man. Um, change your hearts or die. With Justin's 2.0, that's going to put our aggregate at a 2.0. Let's go ahead and jump to our Rotten Tomatoes segment, see what the critics and users think about Jack O. All right, folks. So what we have here is the Rotten Tomatoes segment for those who are new to the podcast. What I what we do here is I'm going to give Rob the chance to guess to the best of his abilities what the critics and users had to say about the film Jack O. Um, unfortunately, because it's there's no soju, there's no real competitive element to this, and I've already seen the score, so I. I guess we're just going to see how close you can get. Bob is really going to be with this. with your game, Randy. All right. Let's start with the critic score. Now, I'm going to – there are two reviews. There are two. Wow. So you have a one in three chance of getting it right. There's no official tomatometer because that's too small of a sample size, but I can do that much math. I have that much ability to be able to figure out the percentage there. You tell <laughs> me what you think the through two critics here – thought about this film can i have a 50 percent, please a 50 percent, bob you one in three and you just couldn't get it you just couldn't figure it it's a zero percent bob this is a goose egg movie on rotten tomatoes have we ever ever come across that before no well well, usually like we don't do these if there's like too small of a sample size where they don't give a, a an official thing because it's not really fair, but in this case, I feel I felt like it was fun to just see how see what if you could guess it because it seems so obvious to me. I'm shocked, genuinely in my core, rattled that you couldn't sort that both reviewers would say no to this. I figured there'd be at least one positive. We have covered so much worse movies than this that have a rating. We have like we so have, much but worse. they're like, but I mean, I don't know. Like if you in this small of a sample size, like what are yeah. the odds? That you're gonna get the one in a thousand people that's gonna say, "I like this movie." I don't know. I would. I like this movie. Well, I'll read the one negative review that's available to read on here and see if it's any good. A cheap horror effort. It has pathetic acting, a jumbled up story, (laughs) and limp, limpid pacing. Limpid. I don't. I I don't know that word. Yet there are several nice murders, and somehow, for all its shortcomings, the film (laughs) seems to capture the spirit of the day it honors. It is basically about a guy with a buy. I just said, I think this got cut off in a weird spot. And there's what? a guy with a, with 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 a bi. I gotta think that that's just Rotten Tomatoes uh... cutting them off midway. This is the kind of movie we're talking about here, people. Rotten Tomatoes cannot finish its sentences about this movie. Wow. Um, all right, now here's the interesting part. There are a hundred plus ratings, and there is an official score of critic or users i mean the users of rottentomatoes.com have spoken between zero and 100 percent. what do you think where do you think this is gonna lie uh i i man i think it's gonna be negative generally not like crazy well maybe crazy low to be honest fuck give me a 40 40 percent too generous again this is 13 (laughs) percent I'm pulling for this movie. I know you do, but man, the people are not. I'm going to read a negative, a one-star review from the users since we're doing this. Um, Watch this train wreck wreck for the laughs. This is one of those films that will have you asking, how on earth did this get made? But is so bad that it's impossible to turn away from it, even harder not to laugh at. I will generally disagree, at least in my experience. Maybe this guy had a a raucous group, group watching, but I sure didn't, so... Mm. Well, I still win because I'm the only player. Can I get a hell's <laughs> key? Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. 
Uh, we I kind of <laughs> hit a shitload of trivia during the normal review, so we'll go ahead and cruise on by trivia. Oh, fuck trivia, man. Nobody fuck likes trivia. that segment. That's for the week. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into Cooter of the Week. Straight chilling. Cooter of the Week. Cooter of the Week. Uh, if you are new to Straight Chilling, uh, Cooter is a character type. We try to identify Cooters if one exists in a movie we are reviewing. Uh, in order to be a cooter, there are five character types. You gotta hit three out of five. Um, those five are patheticness, overall attire, manipulation, sexual deviance, and- um, Smug arrogance. Smug arrogance, thank you. That would be the yes. fifth one. Do yes. we have anybody we'd like to take to cooter court this week, uh, Randy? God, let me think here. Um, I, th- I mean, there's not did a these, ton of. Huh? Do these characters even have names? Yeah, I really. That's. <laughs> can we even start talking about any of these characters? I kind of want to put like, okay, here's my suggestion. The the Judd Nelson in the beginning that that ta- actually the guy who pulls the uh, cross out of the ground, the one who actually does that physically. Yeah, I would nominate him maybe because he uh, definitely has smug arrogance. My God, that guy is exuding cootery arrogance. Am I wrong about that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, I think you're he right. does. I mean, like, like, yeah. m- it, so does the other guy to some extent, but she, he definitely does. He does the fucking the fake out scream. Actually, you know what? That was kind of a funny moment of the movie where he, like he's off sca- off camera or whatever and you hear him scream and the presumption is, oh, he got attacked and killed and it shows him and he's sitting there like with his tongue out in a really silly way. And I, I thought to myself, oh, I thought it was legit. I thought they were playing it straight. And I was like, oh my God, this movie is really going to go for it. And then he, it was a fake out thing. And I was like, ah, oh, man, that that's worse. I wish that was a legitimate attempt at a dead guy face, but it was... It was not. Anyway, but I would say that 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 fits the prototype of, of a cooter, the arrogance thing, the manipulation, maybe to some extent. We don't spend a lot of time with him or most characters, so it's kind of tough to say. Yeah, I'm trying to think of another person that I would nominate. Nobody's like really coming to mind. There's not honestly. a strong candidate here, which is surprising to me actually the, I feel like the strongest candidate to me is the executive producer fred Olin <laughs> that's well that's the i one mean that stands i'll out. take your word for it based on everything you've said that that sounds pretty goddamn arrogant to me uh, it definitely sounds like there's some manipulation involved it's definitely i don't know what he looks like so i can't speak to that uh the sexual deviance of uh, the way he approached the linea quigley question might qualify yeah um, and the comments about his bed yeah and going after somebody's family on a public yeah. release, that's that I think that would qualify as pathetic. Yeah. I think you have a pretty strong case here, actually. <laughs> I think that dude's a real life fucking cooter, to be honest. God damn. Um, yeah, I think that I don't really have any like the only other thing I could think of was Linnea quickly saying she likes little boys, but I mean but yeah, she was just, talking to a grown man she was talking to a grown man and trying to hit on a grown man by talking about how she likes little boys that's really just kind of funny and like stupid um yeah that seems like something like a charlie kelly would say on accident like not meaning what it sounds like he means but you know what i mean yeah i like your um, boyish outlook your boyish charm but she said i like little boys which I is like little boys. not yeah, how you want exactly. to phrase that yeah. but that's that doesn't that doesn't compare to like completely shitting on your former colleague's family in a public format that's yeah. pretty shitty <laughs> like <laughs> i yeah i'm i want to give this to fred olin ray cooter of the motherfucking Let's book week him. i want to do it take it olin ray take it. you've been booked motherfucker we're gonna get arrested who's the shit pickle now mother oh shit <laughs> Pickle. Let's make this like. Are you calling a cootie queen, you lint liquor? 
Um, not me. I'm calling you a fucking shit pickle. Uh, I think we got him. I think we got him. Let's uh, Look let us ass. let us carry on our merry way. It's time to let our hair down. We're getting into what we've been watching this week. Hey gang, what, what you been, been watching? watching? Randu, what you been watching? Oh my, actually quite a bit this week. Um, so one thing I've been meaning to mention for a few weeks that I slowly worked my way through, I could have gone a lot faster, but I decided to take my time with it. It's a show that I've been meaning to watch all the way through for a long time. It's extremely short because it's British and it's called Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. I might have brought this up in a previous episode, but I finally like got through it, through it. Um, and man, that is one of the funniest things I've seen ever. It, like this is the, this is a like, when we were talking about malignant and talking about stuff, that's what actually spurred me to go watch this because people were saying, Oh, it's intentionally bad. It's camp. It's whatever this movie, the Garth Marenghi's dark place is exactly that. And it does it on multiple levels. That's really funny. So to set the stage for people who don't know what this is, it's a British comedy series that's positioned as a eighties um, medical drama slash X Files y, like monster creature featurey thing. Um, and the way it's, it's Garth Marenghi's Dark Place. So Garth Marenghi is a character in the show who is a horror writer, a prolific horror writer, or whatever, who you with his own money created this show that never got aired because it was too bad. And he's like very exceedingly up his own ass about it. And they intersplice the show, it's the show within a show of the actual hospital and all the monsters and shit with him and the other actors who are characters playing the actors talking about their decisions, talking about the show as if it was commentary on the thing. It's like, so it's got two levels of commentary going on. It is extremely fucking funny. It's tough to describe, but if you go look at it, it's all on YouTube for free. I don't know if it's supposed to be, but it sure is. <laughs> and it's only six <laughs> episodes. I think they're like, less than half hour each go check that shit out it is very very stupid and funny for those there it's been memed too like i know that there was one moment that gets memed a lot which is garth Marenghi talking to camera and a and a um cutaway or whatever in a, in a behind the scenes interview where he's like i know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards <laughs> and <I'm> like, <laughs> <laughs> that's i love that it's so fucking funny it's so good and like i I'm just going to keep gushing about it pointlessly if I, if I keep talking. So I want to watch, watch it. That sounds amazing. It is truly really, 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 really funny. <laughs> Please. Nice. You will, you will like it. Um, all right. And then I also watched a couple of like in the Halloween spirit. I like, I was looking for like kind of off the beaten path ha Halloween movies, which Jacko kind of is. And I was grateful for that. But also I watched kind of in the same vein to, Disney Channel movies that I saw as a child that were in the Halloween vein, which were the famed Halloween Town, which I had mm. seen quite a bit. And then one called Don't Look Under the Bed, which I was particularly interested to watch because I had heard that they stopped airing it because it scared kids too much. Mm -hmm. um, so I, having rewatched Halloween Town, I was like, I've seen that before. It's it's nostalgic for me, but it's real dumb and silly. And, you know, I, I know that a lot of like the Disney adults and a lot of other people have fond memories of it. It's just not a good movie, though. It's, not, it's 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 fine. It's good for kids in Halloween. It's good with the spooky season. It's worth a watch. I would watch it again. I wouldn't ever write it off. Um, but it's tough for me to like separate that from my own nostalgia. So it's fine. Don't look under the bed is just as bad, but I don't have any nostalgia for it. Um, and what that is, I mean, Halloween Town is about literally a town based on Halloween. So there's ghouls and and fucking skeletons and witches and warlocks and all that stuff just wandering around like going to costco and shit um and then in well not exactly that but like, um exactly that That's exactly I mean. that um and but don't look under the bed is about a girl who starts seeing a an imagine starts having an imaginary friend it's not her imaginary friend it's her little brother's imaginary friend and for some reason she can see him and he's doing all these things to like i can't remember what he's doing but it's like it's whatever the Disney Channel version of killing people in their sleep is that Freddy Kruegering them a little bit um, or make him disappear or something. I can't remember, but is I, I watched this at the beginning, like right after last week's episode. So it's been a few minutes and it's not a very memorable movie in a lot of ways, but um, it's just kind of silly. And there's a boogeyman and 
and apparently boogeymen come from imaginary friends who are abandoned. So it's got an interesting bit of lore going on. And I guess the scare, like I was looking for the thing that makes kids that would have freaked kids out. And I guess it was just the prosthetics on the boogeyman because it is a little bit spookier than you would see on the Disney Channel, I think. But it really, to me, it was like maybe a little overblown. I feel like they just kind of like copped out and somebody got like one too many emails and was like, fuck it, we'll just take it off. We'll just play Halloween Town again. So I don't know. It didn't really live up to the band content label, but it is fine. Uh, I rewatched WNUF Halloween special. Uh, nice. I like it. I I like it more and more each year. Like I, the first time I saw it, it was right after watching Ghost Watch, and it's impossible for me to come out with the same level of enthusiasm for WNUF as I do for Ghost Watch. I really love Ghost Watch. It's a fucking all timer for me, uh, and they're very much the same kind of premise. Of um, uh, we we've covered it actually, but um, a newscast about you know haunt a haunted house or whatever going wrong live um and this one it's got like the cooteriest fucking character in the world which is frank i forget his last name but the 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 on location um an announcer or whatever is this guy frank and he's like just a shitty petty piece of shit constantly and that's a lot of fun to watch and they also intersplice a bunch of like really fake but like mostly pretty on the money commercials that would have passed for like local commercials in the 90s um, and it's all run through VHS filters and shit. So it, it, it gives a lot of nostalgia and Halloween vibes. It's still worth a watch. And I like it more every time I see it. Um, Maniac Cop I saw for the first time. I really liked that, even though I was not paying full attention because I was also doing some work. And I need, I, I want to go back. I'm gonna, I think I'm going to go back soon and rewatch it in its entirety and then maybe ca- catch the other two. Because I did quite enjoy it. You know, it was not as silly as I thought. Or maybe I was just tempered by the fact that I'd seen so many silly movies recently. I had just finished like Halloween Town and shit. So, uh, yeah, it was a lot more like on the, it's rare to see, or I guess for, at that time, it seems like it's rare to see Bruce Campbell playing it completely straight. And it was, that was nice to see. I thought he did a great job. Uh, like you said, we watched Elvira and House in Haunted Hill last night. Elvira's fabulous. I, I, I really like that movie. It's another one that's like, seems like it'd be great for kids, except it's the horniest movie of all time. So like, horny. every joke, but like so every joke horny. is like a dad joke level pun but you can't laugh about it with your kids because it's all centered around Elvira's giant titties <laughs> yeah. or uh, that one lady sitting on somebody's face. Or I her. do. I want to, I want to, this is a total tangent. I'll make it quick. Uh, this, this past week in the Slack channel, we were making all these like uh, oh, uh, puns. Like we we're turning like horror movie titles into like porn versions porn of them. Like, yeah what what would they be and my the one that sticks out to me the most one that you put out there randy and it was the hills have big old tits and that shit (laughs) killed me that is quite that's the i mean that's the one that's not a pun that's just it's that's why it was just breaking format not clever at all but dude i we did like 400 of those things in like two hours so many nuts how many people were i mean everybody likes to make a pun everybody likes it's a fucking word game it's fun <laughs> i loved it that was great yeah it was uh, let's peg jessica to death it was my favorite one that i had <laughs> um <laughs> that's uh, so fucked up <laughs> <laughs> um anyway so last couple things uh, i got the new wario wear game it's fun not much to say there. If you've played a WarioWare game, that's basically what you're getting there, except it's co-op. It's fun. Uh, and then I saw the Mario movie announcement, which made the world collectively shit a brick. And I think, man, the, the Chris Pratt tide has really t- soured. And honestly, it soured for me a while ago. I, I'm so tired of seeing this man. Um, and I just don't really understand the, the logic of doing that stuff. It, they're they're making the emoji movie of nintendo and i just don't like i just can't support that shit it's just it's too by the numbers you're kind of like it's so weird to me that nintendo is so protective of their ips to the point where they won't release things that people have been begging for for fucking years they won't release earthbound one of the most beloved series of all time that american never or earthbound three or mother three i guess they call it like they're they haven't released that in the states yet and all these fucking things that they're so protective of but the first and second time they passed the reins off to a fucking Mario movie up to people, 
the first time they go get this fucking wackadoo anti-capitalist fucking Bob Hoskins thing, which is nuts. And I still kind of love for nostalgic reasons. Same, and then yeah. the second time they kind of go like the most down the middle safe route possible with an animated CG feature. And it's, it's just fucking irritating to see more of these movies come out like that. I, I, I'm tired of movies that are more defined by who's by the list of names on the poster than anything else about it. So tired of that shit, especially animated because it's displacing all these really good fucking voice artists. Charles Martinet's in it, but he's not even going to, he's just going to be some like offhanded joke about Mario sounding stupid. Like it just doesn't work anyway. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm big mad about it. Of course. I'm a big baby. I'm crying. I'm crying. I hate it. Um, But yeah, it's, it's just a dumb decision. And I'm, I'm just, you know, soured on the whole prospect in general. That's it for me. That's my big complaint moment. Nice. Um, we, uh, we were talking about Hellfest in the Slack channel, and I was like, man, I hadn't seen Hellfest since it came out, so I threw that on this past week, revisited it. I, I actually enjoyed it more than I remember enjoying it uh, when I first saw it. It's basically about uh, this group of teenagers. They go to this theme park, and it's it's all done up like Halloween Horror Nights. They got a bunch of like haunted houses you can walk through. It's very spooky. It's It's you know, Halloween season. And it turns out there's like a real life slasher in there killing people. Um, and these kids uh, eventually realize that they're kind of running for their lives. Um, it's got a Tony Todd cameo in it as well. Um, it's, it's treated like pretty seriously. It's not, it's not super mm-hmm. goofy. It's not very tongue in cheek. Um, it's also, uh, it's very accessible. It's on Netflix and I think it's might be on Amazon too. So you, you can find it really easily. Uh, they handle it well. It's like a pretty legitimately good slasher. Um, you know, I like meat, I've meat heard, potatoes. I've heard like, yeah. like slow building rumblings about that movie. And maybe it's because it's out on Netflix and so more eyes have been on it. But yeah. it seems like more people have been saying more or less what you just did, which is, you know, this is actually fairly good. And it got overlooked when it came out. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty solid. The the characters are like decently developed. It's it's hmm. it's better than you would anticipate, honestly. So yeah, don't uh, if you if you're looking for some like new Halloween related shit to watch this year, throw in Hellfest. Like I said, it's on Netflix. It's it's easy to find. So it's pretty good. Yeah. Um I also speak, speaking of like Halloween related bullshit, I checked out this movie called The Barn. Um, this was put out a mm. few years ago. I want to say like four, four is years ago. Is it quickly ago, in that somebody. too? Yes. Yeah, she mm. is. Um, this was put out by Scream Team Releasing. They're uh, an indie horror movie production house. They've made a few movies. That, uh, they made 1031, 1031 Part 2, handful of other stuff. Um, but it's all like, it's, it's very low budget, very DIY or do, do I, I, whatever, do, do the shit. However <laughs> do the yourself you it. Do, do your shit. Uh, it's pretty fun though. It's definitely, uh, speaking of like original lore, it's, re- it's very much about that. It's about this like haunted barn on Halloween night. And there's like these three demons that, uh, come after you. If you like break any sort of Halloween traditions, um, uh, there's like a, a jack-o'-lantern, um, there's a scarecrow, a candy corn scarecrow, and there's like a, an evil miner, and they all have their own like bits of lore. And I had um, no there's idea like that was a Halloween centric movie. Oh yeah, yeah, it's all I about no Halloween, hundred oh, percent. Um, which is which is why I ended up I picked it up. Um, but yeah, it's like it's got a lot of charm to it. It's sort of it's like kind of like an updated version of Jack O. To be honest, it's like not well, quite big it's, shoes it's, to fill. Yeah, yeah, it's like it's cheesy, <laughs> but it, it knows what it's doing. It's like it's very much riffing. On, it's riffing on movies like Jacko, you know. But it, okay. it it so it's got this like intentional cheese to it that you may be about, you may not be about. I don't know. It's kind of up in the air. It, it, it depends. It's all personal taste. I thought they did a pretty good job with it. Um, they they did like an Jacko original soundtrack. So I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I, <laughs> That's we'll this my bias. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I dug this movie quite a bit. I would definitely recommend checking that out. I also, for like some very strange reason, like after, after uh, watching that Leonard Skinner documentary, I was scrolling through Netflix and, and the Metallica documentary, it's called Some Kind of Monster, was recommended to me. Oh my and God. I watched it like back when I was like 15 or whatever the fuck that shit came out. 
And I didn't really care about it then. I was like, I don't know, morbid curiosity. I'll throw this on again. And it's fine. <laughs> like, it's, if you want to well, see Metallica write some very okay music, you can do that for two hours. I, I don't know. I, I, I remember seeing there's a, you know, Todd in the Shadows. I've mentioned him before. I think I've posted yeah. his stuff on our Slack. He reviews music and music related stuff. And he does a show called Train Records, which is, you know, terrible records. And he talks about why they failed, why they're bad, whatever. And he did one on, what is it? My, my, my kind of, St. Anger, was it? St. Anger is the name of Saint the record. Anger, yeah. Right. yeah. So, and I've never listened to this. I'm not a big Metallica person. So forgive me. But I like, that he talked about that documentary. He's like, it's so weird to see a documentary about such a universally hated album <laughs> yeah, and the making of it and seeing that it makes perfect sense because these guys are just at each other's throats all the time. And does that track for you? Yeah, for sure. They go into the writing process uh, and they, they, they tried to, I, I guess they, they were at each other's throats when they were writing a lot of their like hit records, but yeah. like half the band was upset about the writing process and they wanted to get it like more hands-on, I guess, more involved with it. So they change all that going into it, but also like at this point in time, they're like selling out arenas in the mid nineties. They're like the number one rock band, like they're, they're big shit. And also like James Hetfield has like a huge drinking problem in this time. So like he's mm -hmm. battling with his own demons and it's like, they start writing this record and then he goes away for like a year and a half to rehab and gets his, himself sorted out, which is a great thing. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And then he comes back to finish the record and he can only work like four hours a day and he's like, because I have to spend time with my family, I got to go to my meetings, I have to like really mainly focus on like my own personal health, which is like respect, re yeah. respectful, but like respectable. Res it's very respectable. But he's like expecting the rest of his bandmates to like not work when he is not there. And they're not about oh. that at all. So they have this like, uh, counselor come in and he's it's they do like group therapy sessions. And it's like, you see them like kind of work through some stuff, but it's very like, it all seems very petty. Like, like the shit that like Lars Ulrich is, is like bitching about, it's just like, it's very cringe to me. I don't like, I don't know why. And why would you let anybody film this? I don't know. I, I just, it baffles you me. Know, I, that's strange, man. Can I tell you something though? I, yes. Be, you had mentioned that Leonard Skinner documentary to me, and I had meant to watch it. So I just wrote down a note here on my notepad, and I auto-corrected to lanyard skyward. <laughs> That's those are the words you meant to type, Randy. Because you just didn't know. Love that, and I'm gonna start a new rock band called Lanyard Skyward, and we're gonna lanyard take skyward. the world by storm. Uh, some kind of monster. I enjoyed watching it, but it's like not. I don't know. It's just it's very it's very cringe. It's very uncomfortable. It's like fuck. No wonder. Yeah. No wonder this record blew honestly it's bad it's real it's real bad um last thing i want to mention is i watched the first two episodes of midnight mass which is the new netflix original oh, series so excited to watch. um it seems like everybody's really loving it um i like i said i watched two out of seven episodes so far i'm very into it i like what it's doing it shit's still very up in the air at the second, the end of the second episode. So like you're trying to get your bearings straight, but I love the setting and like the character introductions. It's, it's very engaging and like the acting is solid. I'm very excited to finish it. So shit, man, I am excited to check that shit out. Everybody's, everybody's just tripping over their own assholes to praise this thing. And they got, man, they got loose assholes. If you're tripping, I mean, yeah, they they hang, they hang real low, but um, hanging, hanging real low. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm a big fan of both uh, haunting on houses at movie <laughs> series. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying. I love Flanagan's work. So like this, like to to hear that this is like being lauded as like his best work right now by a lot of people is pretty fucking daunting. And I kind of want to go in, go in with a tempered expectation. But I am getting more and more excited to check this fucking thing out. Yeah, I'm a fan so far. Hopefully, I'll finish it up for real soon. I don't know. Maybe we'll have to do a mini cast on that if we, we should we finish it probably. Up. I probably I gotta worth find it. the time to finish it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I gotta got watch to Lanyard do. Skyward first. Gotta do it. Uh, that's all I've been watching this week. We got one more segment, and that is, of course, our hotline screens. Hotline screens. <laughs>
All right. If you're listening and would like to call and leave a voicemail to be featured on next week's show, hit us up at 904-638-3231. We have a metric fuckload of voicemails this week. We're going to get through as many as we can. Uh, first up, we're going to hear from our boy, Brandon. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey, boys. Uh, Brandon calling. Uh, I'm just calling in about the uh, question, like, sort of to go along with what Miles said about Short Circuit 2. When I first watched that, I mean, my dad, I mean, I'm not, I was born in 94, so I watched that when I was probably like six or seven. My dad was like, oh yeah, I watched these movies when I was younger, like, let's watch that. So we're watching it, and yeah, now that scene, like, he gets his shit kicked, and he's like crying and begging and I was falling. I was so sad. Like we had to turn the movie off, I'm pretty sure. And then like recently, like probably like two years ago, I tried to watch it again. And like I barely got through that scene. I was falling. So I mean if you want to watch a movie that's gonna fuck you up, watch that. Um but probably even more embarrassing is like Five years ago, um, my wife and I, we really love animated movies. Like Disney, Pixar, we'll go to them. So this movie called Inside Out came out. Um, and it's about all the emotions that live in this person's head, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And we're in the theater watching this. And, like, we're definitely the oldest people there other than parents. And then there's this one scene where, like, there's an imaginary friend. And basically they have to, like, it, like, sacrifices itself to, like, help these emotions to get whatever. And, like, I'm falling in the theaters because it's so fucking sad. And my wife turns to me, like, she's my girlfriend at the time, and she turns to me and she goes, are you crying right now? And I was like, fuck off. <laughs> oh, it was so sad. And I'm like, I'll cry to this day about that. I mean, I'm a bitch when it comes to movies. Like, I cry in majority of movies, but... That was something else. So if you guys want to see something that's going to fuck you up emotionally, check that out. Anyways, good shit, boys. Talk to you later. Peace. Bob, have you seen Inside Out? I haven't seen either of those movies. Short Circuit 2 oh, really? or Inside Out. Yeah. yeah, I haven't seen Short Circuit 2. I guess it's an like a, uh, that is not an isolated incident, apparently. Um, but yeah, that scene in Inside Out is pretty fucking sad it's very much yeah. like it's got like i mean pixar isn't does that though like they'll they'll throw in a scene that just makes you fucking like weep like a child um because they're i guess they're just that fucking good at doing that shit i mean it, it really, and, yeah yeah this is a children's film fucking up ruined people within the first like before the opening credits that movie fucking made people blub, blub, blubbering masses in the theaters this one did it at least had the decency of waiting till mid movie. <laughs> I don't know. Good call. Sounds like Brandon's a little bitch. Not really. Thanks for calling, Brandon. I'm right there with you, buddy. I cried during the movie Simon Birch, which is a movie nobody but me remembers, but it was a very sad movie. It was a heartwarming movie that ended sadly. I don't think I saw that either. I need to watch more movies. Apparently, you 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 don't need to go with Simon Birch. It's not a movie that people don't have to remember. Uh, next up, we're gonna hear from our boy G Baby. Let's hear what he has to say. Hey, what's up, crew? It's G Baby. Uh, I wanted to call in about a couple prompts from this past week. Uh, first one, uh, where's Where's the weirdest place you banged? Uh, so I'm pretty vanilla when it comes to places I've banged. <laughs> but the wildest I've ever gotten is in nature whilst camping. Uh, but the weirdest place I've had sex with myself, that's another story. Uh, so I was about 19, so around 2004, uh, I found myself driving back up to Northern California from LA. Uh, I was just outside of Bakersfield, uh, staring down about another six hours or so in the car, and there's just it's fucking nothing out there. Boringest drive, uh, 
hardly anyone on the highway. Um, and I was, I was fucking super horned up, uh, hormones raging. Like I got hit by like a bolt of horn lightning. Um, so I was just like, I know I can crank one out right now. I'm sure of it. Um, and so I did, uh, driving my 86 Buick Regal 70 miles an hour, Highway 99 northbound. Uh, and I think, um, <laughs> not proud of it, but I can say that I've waxed the porpoise on the open road, which should finally cement me in the halls of Cooterdom. So, um, what movie terrified me as a kid? That fucking troll fuck from Cat's Eye really freaked me out. So, um, anywho, uh, take care of Mangs, well, Mangs, and children. Keep chilling. Well, hopefully children aren't listening to that. Um, but ca- may I say, California man strikes again. Yeah, there you go. I, Jim always drops the crazy knowledge on the, the sexual related prompts, and I appreciate the hell out of it, man. Yeah, that is <laughs> forthright shit, and we, re- we respect that around these parts. Yeah, bringing the truth. To uh, our own detriment. <laughs> yeah, that is... Uh, fantastic uh dude <laughs> fucking bolt of j- j- lightning. dude p- playing a little jacko while you drive 70 down the pacific coast highway sounds like a fucking cronenberg movie about to happen um yeah that's uh yeah <laughs> th- thank god you did not uh swerve or anything or hit Demon me uh, seed gee, i don't know man thanks well, thanks, babe. For, th- thanks for sharing g baby Next up, we're going to hear from our boy, Corey. Where does Corey masturbate? Let's find out. Corey, tell us about your masturbatory habits. Bob, you ignorant bitch. <laughs> uh, hey, guys. This is uh, Corey calling about the Calvair episode. Um, I just listened to it last week. And uh, go figure, probably the most surprising thing about that episode was uh, Randy's trigger phrase for me saying, oh, yeah, there aren't stories in the bible about people fucking cows um which yeah so there there aren't uh at least not that i can remember but for this whole movie potentially being like this view on religion or christianity um there is the story of moses going up to uh, mount sinai to get the uh, ten commandments and like basically as soon as he leaves um the eyesight of the israelites they immediately take all of their gold and cast it into a cow. Um, so I, I think y'all basically hit like all the points or probably most of the points. You just didn't quite realize how well you'd hit them. Um, but yeah, it sounds like, and I have not watched this yet. So just from the podcast, um, it sort of sounds like what happens uh, when people become delusional, like maybe the chick, was almost like a messiah, um, you know, to this uh, village of people. And when she was gone, they just kept trying to insert other things in her place. Um, You know, the cow, like immediately after she is dead, you know, this cow probably became like their um, messiah, their moosiah, I'm sorry. Uh, And then once this other guy comes in, I don't know, maybe he looks close enough to the chick where they're like, oh, well, clearly this guy, um, this person is, you know, our Messiah returned, and that's why everyone won, uh, wanted him. Um, I can only guess the difference between, like, the husband and then the village might be the difference between, like, a mistaken prophet and then just the mistaken people, where, like, everyone is just so far deluded that, you know, they're all imagining that this person is absolutely the second coming of their you know, whatever the chick represented. So I'm going to give it a watch in the next couple of days and I'll, uh, I'll call back to see if I figure anything else out, but, uh, yeah, keep, uh, keep chilling. So Corey said they put all of their gold inside of a cow, right? I mean, no, he's talking about they melted down their gold into the golden calf statue, which they oh. then praised, which is actually a pretty, pretty good Got point. You. And like, I was thinking about it here and I'm like, so that combined with, um, I think it was, 
I don't remember exactly, but I think Nicole might have said something to the effect that it's supposed to be. Oh no, it was it was part of Justin's trivia where he was like, the director wanted all these characters to be the same character, you know, like they were all like some manifestation right, yeah. character. Yeah. And that, like okay, so this woman was that guy, that one person's god, and this is his subconscious, you know, dealing with that. And some, I guess I could kind of see that. I don't know. This is kind of like going back to a whole like we're going jumping in the middle of a pretty deep well there but good call I yeah think. yeah maybe yeah. some interesting tidbits there yeah that's a good point thanks for bringing that up uh cory definitely yeah hit us up after you watch the movie and see if, if you come up with anything else um and cory definitely knows more about like biblical shit than i think probably any of us so that would be a a useful resource uh, here i am thinking they just like rammed all their gold into a cow that's not the case yeah that's, that's <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's it's I'm, a graven worship sort of thing. Like that's yeah. why no, it's I'm, on the commandments. <laughs> I, I read that. I know what happened. I know oh, that I, oh. I am right. I know that happened. Look, uh, I know that happened, and yeah, I don't know. Yes, I don't know. Can't tell me. You can't tell me nothing. Thanks for calling, Corey. Next up, we're gonna hear from Logan. Let's hear what she has to say. What up, straight chilling crew? It's Logan. Um, I'm probably going to get pushed to next week, which is fine because I'm waited until I'm on my way to Sunday brunch, but, uh, y'all's topic for the past week was the most disturbing kids movie you ever saw. And for me, it would definitely have to be Disney Channel original movie, um, Don't Look Under the Bed, which was fucking horrifying to me as a kid. Um, I think the title kind of speaks for itself, but I definitely still have a hard time thinking that the literal boogeyman is under my bed. So uh, that was a trip. Um, But I've been listening to y'all's top 10 episodes, like a bunch of them throughout the past couple of weeks. And I've gotten to the 2020 one now and it's so fucking funny um with the whole jet ski thing that uh spoilers <laughs> that y'all do at the end it made me fucking cackle the first time that it happened i had to pause because like, i was laughing so fucking hard um so happy spooky season happy that we're getting closer and closer even though we've been already in the semi spirit since july 5th those of you who are truly hard with us uh looking forward to hearing more from you guys and as always love to the slack channel where to begin wow uh, yeah where to begin with chances? that shit what are the fucking that is insane serendipity um that you she would bring that up and bring the other side of that that discussion because that is the reason i watched that <laughs> is because i had heard people like kids had reacted poorly in some way so I guess I take back what I said earlier. I guess it was really fucking kids up. To me, it, it really didn't seem like it rose to that, but I'm also in my fucking 30s, so. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen it. I can't speak to it, but apparently it fucked enough kids up that they did pull it, so there's got to be something to it, you know? I guess. Um, I mean, at least for it, those kids there, are, at least for Logan and her and her, her, her sad, sad, stunted brethren. Yeah, I mean, the proof is right there. I mean, they fucked fuck. Logan up. On the Logan's other side of mom things. is the one that got that shit pulled specifically. She's like, not my baby. Not on you know, Disney. You're pulling that shit. It really, I mean, it really must have fucked her up for her to think it was funny that we died and went to hell. I mean, Jesus Christ, Logan, have a little <laughs> empathy, will you? <laughs> that literally happened. We went to hell, but we came back because yeah. there's more, more movies needed to be reviewed. So here we are. The, the world <laughs> needed us. I couldn't say that without laughing. I literally could not. <laughs> Thanks for calling, Logan. Always good to hear from you. Uh, last but not least, we're going to hear from our boy Cole. Let's see what he has to say. Hey, guys. Canadian Cole. Calling here about cooters. I, now, I've had this thought for a really long time. Like back when there was only four points, you guys were just training us how to be cooter hunters. And I've always thought about calling in and, and, uh, and saying this. But then, you know... I says to myself, I says, 
simple, don't overcomplicate things. So I wait, and time goes on. You guys get even better at cooler hunting. You bring in the fifth point. You really lock it down. And I think, you know, Cole, I don't need this from you. So I push it down deep, deep into my brain, and I try to forget about it. But then all night of the demons comes along. And it's rain and cooters. And I think, is it time? But uh, before I go on, I just want to say quick, that I, when I voted for Night of the Demons, I thought we were talking about the 1980 with uh, Bigfoot, where the guy gets his dick ripped off by Bigfoot. So if you haven't seen that, you should probably go watch that. But anyways, I should uh, I should get on with my point before I get cut off. Uh, so my idea was, each point of the five stars of cooterdom, uh, smug arrogance, sexual dignity, overall looking attire, overall patheticness, and manipulation, uh, each category could have, like, uh, say, three tiers. So, for example, uh, Jeremiah Sands would hit a three on overall patheticness. And then, at the end, you could count up all the points to decide who's cooter of the week. Now, I don't think this is necessary in every episode or every movie, but when it comes down to you got a whole bunch of cooters and, you know, you got some hit high on on sexual deviancy, but none of the others, or you get a little bit of each, I think, I, I don't know, maybe I'm overcomplicating it, but I think it can come in handy. Uh, let me know what you guys think. Keep showing us. Bye. Well, good call. Um to kind of answer that, I mean, there that was in the mix for a while there. I mean, if, if you go back, I think on our Instagram, right? Yeah, Instagram, yeah. On Instagram, Soju took command for a little bit, and it just kind of fell off because we all have, you know, lives, of kind of, um, that we have to attend to. And it basically had a graph that ranked, I think it was on a scale of three per also, um, something like that. I don't, that, know, I don't know that he... Did, it wasn't like a numeric graph. It was this weird sort of like amalgamation. It was like a five pointed, mm-hmm. it's a like polygraph, I guess. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess that's probably the best way to describe it. And he would like move the points. Like the further out they were, the higher they hit on each point. It's not a star graph. That's something else. I, I don't but, know what the fuck. No, it's but called, like there honestly, was a but... numerical like component to that because that tells you where the point on the star reaches on that particular branch which is why you would get weird shaped things instead of like filling it out. Yeah. I think anyway, just it's tough to describe. It in like MS paint though. I don't think no, no, it, no, was no, like no. He, it was a generated crap. thing. I'm pretty sure. We'll yeah. have to confer with Zoji. Show me, check. But, show me the money. I, I don't remember. This. I don't know. Nevertheless, like I, I still think that's kind of a good idea. It's just a really a matter of, uh, of time, but also it's a matter of this, which is that, uh, despite us trying to nail this down, th- cooter hunting is a lot like mind hunting in that uh, mm-hmm. it's more art than science in a lot of ways. <laughs> and a lot of it's, pl- a lot, a lot of it you're playing by feel a lot. I mean, it's more, it's like jazz. It's, it's the points you don't play. You know what I mean? It's the points you don't talk about that you don't, that you just kind of feel. I was thinking the other day that maybe there's, because we were talking about Elvira on the, sh- on the, the, the Elvira movie. And somebody was like, is Elvira a cooter? And I was like, Honestly, she kind of hits a few points, but I like her too much. And I feel like maybe that's kind of its own point on the cooter scale, which is like its own sixth spot, which is how hateable is this person? Do you hate them? Because I don't hate I don't I don't hate Elvira at all. I think that shit's badass. Like she's just being funny to me. But she I mean, sexual deviance, I mean, yeah. <laughs> She manipulates a bunch of high schoolers into painting her house for her and shit. Uh, I don't know. Her looking attire is is called out frequently. I mean, she would be a cooter on the scale we have now, but playing it by feel, I just don't feel it. I don't feel it for a long I don't feel it. Yeah, I don't feel it either. I think you can make a solid argument based on the points we have outlined, but mm-hmm. I don't think that would work, though. It doesn't feel I right. I wouldn't book her. I wouldn't no. convict. Yeah, that's not a bad idea, Cole, as far as breaking yeah. it down with like a point system or whatever. But we would ha- we would probably need like a, le- a, g- a legit graph like to post each week or something, which is just more work. I mean, we could talk it out, but then we have to like remember what the fuck we say and stuff. And that's just impossible. We can't do that. 
We can't do that. You can't do more things, guys. Come on. Can't do it. Thanks for calling, Cole. Uh, again, if you want to hit us up, leave a voicemail to be featured on next week's show. You can do so at 904-638-3231. I kind of want to hear, like, if when you were a kid, did you have anybody doing, like, a little home haunt on your street or, like, a weird thing in the garage? Yeah. Much like in the case of Jacko. Uh, anybody wearing like gorilla costumes t- chasing you down the street? I want to hear about that. Share your experiences. I definitely want to hear about that. There was another thing we were talking about prompting, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> so that, that's as good as anything. Yeah. Call that's it. Better than nothing. Yeah. And uh, what, what a perfect time to do so because this is our last episode of September. Next episode Ooh. is going to be legit October Ooh. spooky punkins, season. Punkins. Pumpkins, oh, yeah. Pumpkins, yeah. Pumpkins, yeah. Pumpkins, pumpkins. Yeah. The good shit, straight to the vein. And we have, not to brag on us too much, we have a legit schedule lined up for October. It we is really do. good. It, we I have a that, lot of good shit. October gets loaded for Halloween, or for, for uh, excuse me, for horror fans. And we know that. So, you know, spend your time wisely. But we are going to be providing a lot more shit than we typically do. Yeah, we got a lot of shit coming down the pike, and uh, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Hopefully you're along for the ride. Uh, starting with next week's show, Pumpkins. we're going to be talking about the movie called The Guest from 2014. Oh my God. Yeah. It happened anyway. It, it happened. happened anyway. This is the first- From the grave. The first you picked the flick from the fourth quarter of 2021. It was chosen by Brandon S. Slam your eyeballs into the guest. Get ready for next week's show. Finally talking about it. Hallelujah. Um, until then, please rate, review, and subscribe to us on iTunes. You can follow us on Twitter at str8 underscore chilling on Instagram at straight chilling podcast. You can send us an email through our website, straight chilling podcast.com. If you want to join in on our daily Slack channel conversations, hit us up on one of our social media outlets and I'll send you a link so you can do so. Don't forget about our Joe Bob live watch party. Don't forget about our Chilloween party. Don't forget about our pumpkins. And until next week, as always, all you mother truckers, please keep chilling. recording stopped trying to figure out how there it is